All right, guys. So afternoon again, and thanks for um, thanks for tuning into this talk. So what we're going to be looking at today, and I know Saeed said that the presentation will last an hour, but it should be finished uh, long before that, so we can have a lot of time for questions. So what we're going to the topic of the presentation, um, it, it's actually a talk I did for the SPE uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so it's more or less the same 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 idea. So we're looking at commitment exploration wells drilled in Trinidad between 2008 and 2019, right? So we, we want to talk about what the actual commitments were, um, what was actually drilled, which were not drilled, and um, you know some of the reasons for this, what are the results, and so on, right? Um, and yeah, I'll get into it right now. Okay, so what are, what are the, the goals really here? So we want to ascertain details of, of the contract signed between the government of Trinidad and Tobago and the various operators between the period 2008 and 2019. Um, so which blocks, which operators, what, how many commitment wells were, were agreed upon, to what depths to be drilled by when, right? So we want to ascertain those details. Um, then to determine which exploration wells were drilled within the committed timeframes. Um, which ones were drilled past the committed time frames and those are what never actually drilled, right? Um, I'll show you guys the, the names and locations and the results of the, of the wells that were, were actually done. Um, we'll touch on the current statuses of each block. Um, some are currently still licensed, some have been relinquished, really so they're currently open and so on. And um, we can discuss some of the reasons that some of these commitments were not met and some recommendations for the government for future bid rounds. Especially important because the government has indicated that they are looking to have uh, onshore shallow water and deep water bid rounds in TNT, um, you know, within the next few months. So um, I think it's a good time to have a discussion like this. And Saeed, if any time um, you, you lost me or have any audio problems or visual problems, just stop me and let me know this. No problem. Okay. So what are commitment wells, right? So in, in most countries, um, when the operators sign contracts, they sign usually production sharing contracts or EMP licenses um, between the, the operators and the, and the country's uh, regulatory body, um, usually a Ministry of Energy, right? So in Trinidad and Tobago, it's the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Um, excuse Javid, just one question. Have, yes. are, you, are you still on your first slide? No, um, you guys still see the first slide? Yeah. Um, okay, sorry. I think it was on the wrong screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, good. So you should be on the highlight slide now, yeah? The highlight, yeah. Okay, good. So right, sorry. So the, the highlight slide um just went through what I just what I just mentioned. And um we're going on to what are commitment wells now, right? So yes, and I just discussed um, the contracts are signed between the operators and the Ministry of Energy. Typically, these contracts have an expiration period. I mean, in Trinidad, usually six years for onshore and shallow water, nine years for deep water, right? Um, and that expiration period is clearly split into three phases, um, a mandatory first phase, so that's the phase you actually must complete, um, an optional second phase, and then an optional third phase, right? You usually only go on to the second phase and third phase if you have um, success or very encouraging results in that monetary first phase. MWOs are listed for each phase, right? An MWO is a minimum um, uh, wet, wet, wet obli work obligation, minimum work obligation, right? These work obligations usually include a minimum amount of square kilometers of 3D seismic, sometimes could be 2D seismic to be acquired. And uh, quite often, most of the times, a minimum number of exploration wells to be drilled. Those wells, um, are, they, they are specified by when you must drill these wells, right? Within what period of signing the contract. So it could be one year, two years, three years, um, as well as depth commitments. So it might be to a minimum depth of 5,000 feet below mud line or a year, or, you know, or sometimes even to a maximum depth in some cases, right? This paper is, this, this talk here is focusing just on those mandatory first phase commitment wells, right? Um, and I'll note that other non-obligation wells would definitely drill by companies during the period of the study, 2008 to 2019. 
but they are not the focus of this study. So people from TNT would know about various wells drilled by operators. I put one example here is BP's Macadamia Exploration Well, which was a successful well. That was not a commitment well, right? So we're not focused on those particular ones. So next slide um, is a table. Um, so I'll give you a couple uh, minutes or a couple minutes to, to look, look at this while I, while I describe, right? So these are the various blocks or contracts awarded between uh, in, in the study period here, right? So the first um, column is the type of contract, production sharing contract or EMP license, right? We don't need to discuss the differences, but more or less just consider the contract between the, um, the government and the operator. Then we have the blocks that were signed, the names of the different blocks based on Trinidad's concession map, the operators that they were signed between, um, location, so we just differentiate them between onshore, offshore shallow water, and deep water, right? Um, effective dates um, are the dates that the contract was actually signed. So that first one was signed in 2008, September 18th, um, onshore Trinidad between Parex Resources, and the name of that block was the CRP shallow, uh, CRP in this case stands for Central Range Block, right? So we find that 26 contracts were signed in this period, 19 of them PSCs, seven of them EMP licenses. The major differences there is around taxation and so on, right? Uh, again, we wouldn't be getting too much into that. Um, overall, these were signed between 12 operators, um, Parex, NICO Resources, Bayfield, Centrica, BG, BP, Trinity, Petrotrin, BHP, Lease Operators Limited, Range Resources, and Touchstone Exploration, right? And some of these companies um, you all may know, uh, some of them you all may not be aware of anymore because those companies may no longer exist, right? For example, BG was bought over by Shell, uh, NICO, operate, NICO Resources, I don't believe they operate anymore, neither Bayfield, neither Parex, right? Uh, and Petroton, of course, was, was closed down and, and, and um, was restarted as its heritage. So uh, five of these blocks were onshore, 10 of them were shallow water blocks, not shallow water, shallow water blocks. Nine were deep water, right? So these were the first, the nine deep water, ultra deep water blocks. Two of them actually covered both land and shallow water. Um, and that's the Guayaguayari blocks. Um, you'll see it there, Guayaguayari, shallow and deep. They actually covered, and I'll show it in the next slide, the map of where these things are, right? None of these blocks were actually awarded after 2014, which is the, uh, unfortunate thing, right? So in the last seven years, there have, there have been no new contracts signed between the government and operators. So it's a concession map of TNT, right? Some of you all, again, might be familiar. Um, so Trinidad and Tobago, the end green, and we have the maritime acreage uh, extending all the way out to the east, to the north, um, which is close to Grenada and Barbados. And of course, both on the west and the south side, we have the Venezuela border. Right? Um, so south and west, Venezuela, north, Grenada, Barbados, way out into the east is going out into the ocean, right? So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna highlight the blocks that were signed. So the 26 of them that we spoke about in the previous slide, these are those 26 blocks, right? Um, I'll toggle back and forth a little bit. So what you'll notice, right, is that a lot of acreage was signed in this period, quite a lot of acreage. Look, up, look at those big ones in the deep water, uh, are huge blocks. You have the North Coast blocks, some onshore acreage, and some shallow water around um, Trinidad, right? So, quite a lot of it. If you count these blocks, you might not realize, you might not get to 26, and you'll wonder why. It's because some of them, like Guayaguayari, and um, Guayaguayari and Central Range blocks, actually have a, a shallow and deep. Um, they actually have shallow and deep licenses. They actually overlay each other. One goes down to a certain depth and the other one goes from there to, to, um, to another depth. So the first, first um, time in Trinidad, those type of contracts were done where they had, uh, they were basically like one overlaying the other, right? And that in itself um, gave way to some complications that, um, and, and I believe those types of contracts were discontinued afterwards. So what were the actual commitments um, per block, right? And I won't dwell on the slide for too long, but just to give you an idea. Um, 
I have here the different blocks, the operators again, the number of wells that were committed in that first phase, right? Um, the time that they had to spot the first well, and then of course the date by which they had to spot the well, right? So again, the first one, we look at Parrot resources. They had committed to three wells. Um, the first well was to be spotted two and a half years after the effective date. So, so they signed that contract back in 2008. They were supposed to, or yeah, they were supposed to drill by, you know, 18 March 2011. And you can see the depth requirements here for those wells, right? So in this particular case, um, first the first contract, all three wells had a, a maximum depth commitment of um, 1,350 meters, right? Um, if we go down to, let's say, let's look at NCMA2, that's number seven. That was signed to NICO resources. Again, three wells were committed. They had minimum TBDs for each well, um, 2,800 for two of them and 4,000 meters for the other. And again, this one was 13 months after the effective date. You'll see some of the, um, the, the, the contracts had 18 months, some 36, some 48. It depends on um, what was negotiated, right? So this, this slide shows the first 11 um, and the commitment wells. And this one shows the, the rest, right? So if you look at the top one over here, you have block 23A, that's a deep water block that was signed to BP. They committed to one well um, at a minimum TVD below mud line of um, 4,250 meters, right? And they, their commitment was 54 months after the effective date. Um, that's about four and a half years. And the, the, you would find that the deep water wells um, had longer periods between, um, between when the contract was signed and when they actually had to drill, right? So they allowed a much longer period for deep water wells. Um, onshore wells probably was a lot shorter, um, shallow water wells also, right? Um, however, you'll notice at the bottom, um, those were the last three blocks signed, um, Rio Claro, St. Mary's, and Ottawa. Those are all onshore blocks in front of that. Four wells each, and you'll see the, the depth commitments there. And you'll see some of them actually go all the way up to five years, 60 months after the effective date, right? Again, it depends on what was um, negotiated and, and so on with the different operators, right? Um, if, well, Said, I guess so far, so good, right? Um, something okay? Yeah, everything is good so far. All right, great. Um, good. So we spoke about the, we saw where the blocks were. Uh, we know which blocks were signed. Um, we spoke about the commitments for each block, right? So I'll go into what actually um, were the results. Okay. So of the 26 contracts that were signed, there were 51 minimum wells that were committed to be drilled. Um, across all of them, right? So 51 wells were supposed to be drilled, right? At a minimum. That's what they committed to um, with the government. The actual number of exploration wells drilled in this period by these operators and these blocks were 25, right? So 25 were actually drilled, 51 was committed. Of that 25, 19 were offshore, six were onshore, right? However, only 17 were drilled per commitment, right? And when I say per commitment, including the timelines, the original timelines, including the original depth commitments, right? Um, so 17 or one third of the original 51 was actually drilled as per the contracts, right? However, some of the operators drilled wells in excess of their commitment. So for example, some operators may have had to drill three wells in their block and they chose to drill maybe four or five or six, right? That actually happened in some cases. So one third of the commitments were actually met and some operators did a few extra, okay? Five of these wells only. So sorry, out of that 17, that 17 actually um, was only, uh, was not drilling, sorry. So let me, let me make sure I'm not confusing here. So that 17 wells were drilled as commitment in terms of depth and which block not in terms of time, right? The five wells were actually only drilled within, um, within the actual time period. So if they had to drill within three years, um, some of the operators drilled it, but they drilled after three years. So we counted them in the 17. But then within the original time frame, only five wells were actually drilled in, within the original time frame. So out of that 51, only five were exactly per the contract terms, right? Which is only 10%. 
Okay? Now, out of that 25 wells that were actually drilled, 13 of them were considered discovery wells, right? Which is about 50%, right? Which is pretty, pretty good, I guess, for exploration. Unfortunately, if you check right now at this current point in time, none of these discoveries are producing oil or gas, right? None of the fields discovered are currently producing, okay? Some of them are in development, um, five, according to, to the information here. So you have two from Touchstone, um, Coho and Cascadura. So Coho is a gas field that is actually supposed to be online anytime in the next two or three months um, on short Trinidad. Cascadura is targeted probably for next year. Um, Trinity has two, two discoveries that, that are being developed and Shell has one that is a part of a North Coast development that also should be on, on stream producer next year. So to summarize, 51 wells here were committed, uh, 17 were drilled per commitment, five actually within the original time frame, 13 were discoveries, zero producing hydrocarbons right now, but five of them in development, right? So what happens when you mean in eight of them? So the other 13 discoveries, five in development, what's going on with the other eight? Um, the first one is from the lease operators, Barakat. Um, the last published information is that that discovery was under evaluation, um, but hasn't begun production yet. The next five is a cluster in the northern deep water blocks um, by BHP, Belly, Tok, Hume, Bongos, Hi Hat. Five of them in the northern blocks. I'll show you on a map in a minute. Um, those are the northern discoveries, deep water northern discoveries by BHP. And they are all entering the market development phase. There is actually appraisal drilling happening in those, in those blocks right now, as we speak. Um, so those, those blocks are in the market development phase. BHP will be evaluating whether those um, discoveries, those fields are commercially viable, right? And then there are two discoveries that BHP made in the southern deep water blocks. Again, I'll show you and I'll map in a minute. And um, those are under evaluation, but have not entered the market development phase yet, right? And there are rumors that as to whether BHP may relinquish those blocks or not. So that's what's happening so far with the, with, with the results of the wells that were actually drilled. So again, it's important to note that contract signed way back in 2008 none of those contracts signed since then have actually had any impact on our production yet, right? Soon with, with Touchstone, but not yet. Okay, so what wells found what, right? That's the question on this slide. Here. Which wells were actually drilled and what did they find? So 25 wells, the ones I mentioned before, um, you'll see the names of them here, Cribo, Mapipi, and so on. Um, you'll see the operator that drilled them and the name of the block, whether it was onshore or offshore, and what was the result, right? So this is just to summarize exactly what I was just saying. Um, the different discoveries, um, red, obviously gas, green, oil, um, and then the, the orange or yellow highlights you see in there, those are the five wells that were actually drilled in time, right? So remember, I said five of them were actually drilled in um, Within the original time frame, these are those five wells the Iris, which was drilled by Centrica, Borokit, drilled by BHP, uh, Los Galios, drilled by Petrotrin, uh, the Clerk from BHP, and Barakat from lease operators, right? So these are the five that are in the minimum uh, within the original time frame, okay? So next slide. So back to the concession map, I want to point out here where these different wells were drilled, right? So I'm pointing to them here, right? You have the Northern cluster, which is up here. Um, these are the five that I said were entering in market development phase, right? So these red ones here, the, um, the, um, the discoveries, they have the Southern cluster, which is the two that I said was um, on the evaluation still by BHP again. You have um, the lobster well drilled by the, uh, well, Shell, but it was BG at the time down here, um, coupled by Trinity out here, um, Bayfield and later became Trinity in this block here. Um, 
This one was the one drilled by Petrotrin. You had a couple here, three of them by NICO Resources. And then you had the IRS well up here by Centrica, right? Um, and of course, some of these blocks have changed uh, operatorship now, right? So this is just a point out where those 25 wells were actually drilled. Um, 19 of them again were offshore, six of them were onshore, okay? And the six onshore wells, so this is where they are. Um, actually, those arrows look like they have been moved off of it, so I'll just name them, right? Um, the, the six onshore wells were, were Martin P and Free Road, that was by Parex. You had um, Cove One Cascade right here by, by Touchstone, and you had Barakat and III here by these operators, right? So these were the six that were actually drilled in. Um, you see it here in the key. Um, and what I what I did is put we put in some of the extra, some of the new wells that were drilled after 2019 by Touchstone. Um, they drilled Cascadero Deep, they drilled Chinook, and they are currently, I believe, just about ready to drill Royston. I'm not sure if they started yet. The rig was being mobilized as of this week. So just put in those wells just to see where they are as well. Right. So those, but those um, Chinook and Royston, and they, they came after the, the study period. So they didn't include them in the, uh, in the numbers. Okay, so yeah, Royston results is to be determined. Um, Coho, of course, found gas, Chinook found gas, Cascadero and Cascadero deep found both oil and gas, or well, condensate and, um, and, 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 and gas, right? The others were dry, except for Barakat was declared as a discovery. So the current status of these different blocks, right? So what actually happened to the blocks? Um, several of them were relinquished. Uh, all the Parex and ICO blocks were relinquished back to the government. Those companies, I don't think they operate anymore. Um, Bayfield um, was uh, merged with Trinity. Um, of course, BG globally was bought over by Shell. Um, Centrica sold off their Trinidad assets to Shell as well. The two BP deep water blocks, 23A and 14, um, BP found out the operatorship to BHP, right? Um, Petrotrain, of course, was closed down and became heritage. And BHP, they relinquished three of their deep water blocks so far, right? Of the nine that they, they had at one point, they relinquished three of them. And then these three last blocks, um, the onshore ones that were signed most recently, they are still are operated by those three companies, right? Lease operators, range resources, and Touchstone, right? And Touchstone is the one that we saw having quite a lot of success in the onshore so far, right? Range resources did not drill any of their wells. Okay, so some possible reasons now why these wells were not drilled in, um, or not drilled any time committed, right? Some of the contract terms may not have been realistic when taking into account the time to acquire and interpret seismic, get regulatory permits, for example, as CEC, which is a certificate of environmental clearance, um, secure rigs, and so on. Um, if you look at the time period here, you know, 2008 to 2014 at least, rigs were in very high demand. It's very difficult to get a rig globally oil prices were quite high. So it, that, that posed a challenge. Um, some of the, the wells, had seismic, some of the blocks had seismic commitments and sometimes seismic was a very long process to get started because you had to do a lot of permitting issues. Um, the EMA took quite a long time to grant CECs to go through their process. So some of the, the time frames probably were not very realistic. Um, you know, that was su suggested and agreed upon um, by the ministry and the, and the various operators, right? So that's one of the possible reasons. There was a lack of initial success in some of these blocks that discouraged companies to continue. So Parex, for example, they drilled a couple wells. They were dry and they did not want to continue to, their, um, to, to the rest of them, right? So there was a lack of initial success. Now, as for the contracts that they agreed to, that wasn't supposed to factor in. They were supposed to have committed to drill these minimum wells, right? But of course, in reality, some of the companies, uh, they choose to, to opt out or try to renegotiate at that point. Um, some of the blocks were found out to other operators. So, example, BP found out their deep water blocks to BHP. So, they would have asked for extensions on their commitments um, because they were now, you know, they, they, they were in the process of farming out. They would have wanted to consolidate um, to use the same rate for a couple of different blocks, probably do seismic over a bigger area, 
So farm and Audi blocks is one reason as well, right? Um, some of the operators experienced serious financial difficulties, right? Um, essentially, some of them had no money to continue drilling, right? Nico Resources was one of them, Range Resources, Bayfield went into, into, into closure. Um, Petrotrin, of course, if, if you are from Trinidad, you, you know the story of Petrotrin. Um, they simply had no more funding, no more money to drill at, at one point, and then the company actually closed down. Um, so so there, there were quite a lot of financial issues, keeping in mind that some of this also took place after 2014, after the oil price crash. Um, but some of it took place before. Some of these companies were unable to drill even long before that, right? And then the last factor is that some of these minimum work obligations were renegotiated with the Ministry of Energy um, due to combinations of the above, right? So some companies went to the ministry and they would have said, um, we, have had not, we have not had very good success. We would like to renegotiate. We don't want to drill two more wells. We want to drill one or we don't want to do seismic, we want to just drill one well. Um, or they said, you know, we have financial difficulties, we would like an extension on, on the time frame. So yes, yeah, so the, the fifth factor is basically renegotiation based on combinations of the above, right? So some recommendations. So what we ran through, you know, was, sorry, uh, I think um, I ended the presentation by accident, one second. Sai, you'll tell me when it comes up, comes back up, please. Okay, no problem. Uh, is it back up yet? Yeah, but we're back on to your regular PowerPoint screen. Tell me if that's okay. No, we're seeing your your um your presentation mode. You know, like with the with the side screen and. All right. Sorry. Let me make sure. Let me do that again. Presentation mode now? Yes. There we go. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. So you're talking about the possible reasons for commitment wells not being drilled. So I was going, so I was going to just recap quickly um, in the next two slides, right? So some of the recommendations um, coming out of, of all of this, right? Um, these are my recommendations. Um, clearly, the, 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 the bid round process um, the minimum work obligations and the contract management has only been partially successful, right? Um, less than one third of the wet well, one third of the commitment wells were, were actually drilled, and much, much only 10% were actually drilled in the, in the correct time frame, right? Um, so, some of my recommendations make open geophysical and geological data public, right? In TNT, TNT is a mature oil and gas province, right? Um, the fields that most of these fields have been explored, a lot of it um, well developed. There are some areas for exploration still. Um, I think that a lot of that data can be made public, right, in an online repository. This would encourage um, existing operators and potential external operators to approach the ministry outside of the rounds for acreage. Um, since they have the ability to work up some leads beforehand and actually analyze and integrate data way in advance, right? They'll be able to do it on their own time, not just during the time constraints of a bid round. When you have a bid round, you usually just have a period which you get to review data, and then you have to um, put in bids and so on, right? And, and then what we've seen is that those bids are sometimes, um, a lot of the times they, they, they are not held to those contracts. So it may, it, I think it's quite valuable that this, a lot of this data becomes public. Um, number two, recommendation. So we look the evaluation criteria during bidding. Right. Um, so if one company is financially capable to exploit one block, so, so part of the, uh, the bid evaluation process, right, is that the, um, the Ministry of Energy and in collaboration with Ministry of Finance and some other entities, they look at the financial capacity of the operators to, to basically conduct the obligation, the, um, you know, the amount of wells decided to consult. Um, but what happens and what has happened in the past is that sometimes an operator might be financially capable. Let's say you need, let's say you need $10 million to, to, um, to drill the well in one block, let's say. 
right? And then and the and the company demonstrates that they have that amount of fi finance available. They'll be they, they, that means that they they're fairly safe to be able to be awarded that one block, right? The problem is the ministry doesn't look at the other blocks that they bid in on because they all look at them individually. So one company might have ten million dollars. They might bid on four blocks. Each of them requires $10 million to, um, to explore, um, and they win all four blocks because they're not looking at it um, holistically, looking at them on a one-by-one -one basis, right? And now the bid, the bid process is supposed to be on a one-by-one -one basis to avoid, um, you know, for, for transparency and to make it very fair, but it, it leads companies, um, it leads them to believe that some companies may maybe overextend in their financial capability, right? So that's another recommendation. Um, Number three, poorly thought out minimum work obligations lead to continuous, continual renegotiations, right? Which defeats the purpose of a competitive bidder, in my opinion, right? If you, I'll give you an, an analogy. If you put a bid on a house or a car and you win, um, you know, you, you, you're buying a car and you're bidding against other people and you, you win that bid, you, you bid $100,000 and you win it. Is really not in good faith to then go back after you beat somebody who bid ninety thousand, and then renegotiate and say you can only bid it, you can only pay eighty thousand, right? Um, that's that's not the purpose of competitive bidding, right? So I I am recommending that you know the open bidding should be should be allowed, which is where companies can approach the the government outside of bid rounds and negotiate with them directly, right? Now that has happened in the past. It is not. I suppose um, encourage per se, right, in Trinidad, but it's something that probably should be looked at way more so that an operator then can look at, let's say, an onshore, onshore block and say, okay, they have access to the data, it's public, they work up some leads and prospects, they think that they want to go after it, they approach the ministry, they say, okay, we want to get this block, um, we're willing to do X amount of seismic, we're willing to drill these amount of wells within this time frame, we're going to do this in five years. Can you sign a contract with us, right? And the Minister of Energy is allowed under the law to negotiate like that um, outside of a bedroom, right? Um, as a mature province as well, we're just not as competitive as, as, as we used to be. People are just not as interested anymore. And the type of operators that we go after needs to be needs to be retort, right? So again, the operators now have a chance to propose things that they think are more realistic, right? In terms of conditions and so on. Um, the number four recommendation here is that um, guarantees are posted um, in financial institution by these operators so that if the companies default on the minimum work obligations, if they actually don't drill the commitment wells or they don't complete what they committed to, the Ministry of Energy is supposed to have the ability to seize, seize the money in that bond. Um, which is, which, is, which is posted, right, as a guarantee. So the ministry can seize those bonds. However, to my knowledge, they've never utilized this provision. So anytime an operator has defaulted on their contracts, they've never actually seized anything. That's really the ministry's only, you know, sort of fallback in case a company um, doesn't, doesn't actually do what they committed to do, right? But they have not exercised that in the past, right? For different reasons, I suppose, um, you're also trying to encourage the companies and other blocks to do work, so maybe they didn't want to, to do that. But again, it, 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 um, it, is, it is an issue that needs to be addressed, right? It, it does empower the operators to breach contracts time and time again if they know there are no penalties for doing so, right? So those are some high-level recommendations, right? And I'll get to the conclusion slide now. Okay. So 26 blocks were awarded between 20, 2008 and 2014 to 12 operators, right? No new acreage was awarded since 2014. Right, which is which is quite an issue that is manifesting itself now where we have very little new gas or oil being found. Uh, 15 of the 26 blocks are still active, right? We went through which blocks those were. Um, there were 51 exploration wells that were committed in these 26 blocks. 17 were actually drilled, but only five was in time, right? Was in the original time frame. Eight extra wells were done um, by the operators, so 25 were actually drilled. 13 of them found hydrocarbons. Zero are producing so far. So again, no bid round since 2008 has yet to have an impact on our production, right? So what I'll, I'll say at this point is that a lot of the new fields that were brought online um, in the last few years from BP, from 
uh, Shell, uh, BHP, and so on. Most of those were either discoveries that happened before and they're now back there, or they were discoveries that happened um, not under commitment. So they were just um, under licenses like BP has, where they were continually uh, exploring on their own merit, on their own volition, and, and then developing those fields, right? So it wasn't committed well. Um, number eight, conclusion. Five discoveries currently in production and development. Um, we expect to see gas from Touchstone uh, this year. Um, Trinity, I'm not 100% sure, maybe next year, I, I, the data on development may be online. Um, and Shell is also carried for next year for the North Coast gas, right? Um, and then the last conclusion here is that the deep water discoveries um, are entering the market development phase. And it can, uh, right now they are having um, appraisal drilling is going on in the North Coast blocks, uh, the deep water Northern blocks. Um, and this is a potential game changer for the gas industry. You all know in the last couple of days, last couple of weeks, serious concern about gas supply, um, train one Atlantic LNG um, issues with a uh, uh, natural gas, natural gas com company and so on, right? Um, but these deep water discoveries, gas discoveries, potentially, um, if found commercially viable, could come online by 2026, 2027, thereabouts. Um, and that could be a big game changer for gas supply, right? Um, the only big set of gas on the horizon right now um, is that all the other gas developments are considerably smaller, right? So that brings me to the end of this presentation. Um, Said, I think we were on the hour definitely. Um, and I welcome your questions now. Yes, most certainly under our, um, thank you very much, Javid, for this very uh, insightful talk. Um, we'll now begin about 30 minutes of question and answers. Attendees, please note that you can continue to send your questions at this time. Um, Javid, I see we have about three of them already in the chat, so I'll just pull them up and read them for you. Yeah, and we can answer on, one at a time, right? Some reason, I'm not seeing them, so if you could read them all. Okay, time. yeah. So, Sukhbir so here Hiralal asked, um, why was there a max depth commitment on some blocks, example Parex? Um, should that not be minimum depth? Good. So remember I was saying, let me just go back to the map for a second, right? And I hope you guys could still see. Yeah. Um, good. So I'm looking at this orange block, for example, right? This one here. Um, this one here. So this block is actually two blocks overlaid on each other the shallow central range block and the deep central range block. So for example, this shallow block may have been from ground level to, I don't remember the, number, the, the commitment, but let's say it was 10,000 feet. That might actually have been the first block. Then the second block might have been from 10,000 feet to uh, whatever, just beyond 10,000 feet. Beyond 10, the reason for the maximum depth commitment is because within this block, you had to have a maximum commitment, otherwise you'd be going into the second block. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, since we're on the note of this though, and I, I imagine this is what you talked about when you said that these type of commitments were um, you know, discontinued, but if an operator has lease on the upper blocks and someone wants to drill to their deeper, to their deeper block, then what's the situation there? Because you have to go through someone else's acreage to get to your acreage. So correct. So uh, in the two onshore blocks that were like that, um, the same operator had both, right? So okay. that problem, not so bad, right? But there were some cases where there were some deep blocks that were overlain by shallow blocks that other operators had. And that posed a very interesting problem to solve. Um, and and it, became, it, it, yeah, it basically became quite confusing as to what would happen there, right? But um, ideally, basically, the, the operator would be the operator of the shallow acreage would have to get permission to, um, to drill through the acreage. That was basically how it would work, right? The complicated case came where you had a seismic commitment right. on a deep block and a seismic commitment on a shallow block, yet a seismic survey is obviously done on the surface, right? Yes. So that actually became the most difficult and complicated part of this from, uh, from, from what I remember. Um, and you know, for those reasons, um, you know, some of this was not was discontinued. I, if I 
did some of the thinking I believe originally about why to have a shallow and deep block was that um, based on Trinidad's geology, there were shallow horizons that were being explored. Those were the ones that were typically always producing, right? Right. Um, yeah, the, the normal ones that produced. And they were trying to encourage deep exploration, right? Which would have been the deeper Herreras and so on. Um, so that was kind of the thinking, I believe, about why to try to do those deep and shallow blocks. Um, Petrotrin actually also had shallow and deep blocks, but they, 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 they owned all of that acreage themselves. OK. Right? Um, so that's just some of the thinking there. Okay, so Dirk asks, um, what do you think will happen with the BHP blocks with the Woodside acquisition? Well, that's that's an interesting one because that, that that's pretty new, right? So Woodside from Australia has recently acquired or is in the process of acquiring BHP. Quiet. Um, BHP has significant assets here. They have oil production and gas production, and of course, these deep water blocks uh, seem to be gas prone, right? Um, in fact, I understand that um, I'm not sure if that's, that's happening, but it, BHP has blocks in Barbados, and they were also going to continue exploration there for um, to start seismic and so on. Um, okay. I don't know. I can't predict exactly what will happen there. If Woodside has, um, if part of their strategy is gas production, and I believe they are a big gas and LNG um, player, they may retain the acreage in Trinidad um, and, and continue to develop it, um, or you know, sell off to somebody else who might want it. And the, the obviously the big players here who are interested in gas would be BP and Shell, right? Right. Um, they are interested in Atlantic LNG. It, it could be a sensible acquisition. But then again, BP and Shell have also said that they are not looking to um, get, to, you know, to stay in hydrocarbon production for, for very much longer. So yeah, it's an interesting question, um, but I think it'll, it'll depend on what Woodside's outlook is um, what their global strategy is, you know, whether they want to focus on particular areas or they want to focus on oil or gas, um, you know, remains to be seen. But but definitely something that we'll need to understand in the next, probably in the next year, because BHP, um, you know, significant acreage will in the country. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess since we're since we're on this topic, I'll throw in one, um, which has to do with the you know this idea of flip the switch, um, which I kind of think you alluded to with a lot of our main oil and gas and mainly gas companies in Trinidad looking towards more greener avenues, right? Or greener avenues um, for energy. What, what I mean, from, from your talk, we know that, okay, we didn't have a lot of the, the commitments being fulfilled until 2014, but then 2014 happened. And so we kind of have to give a, a few years leeway for, you know, companies recovering from that. Um, but moving forward, what do you see like the the outlook of of exploration and just drilling in general um uh, across trinidad uh moving forward with in, in in um well i guess with the idea in mind that we're moving towards a more uh a more more, more a, gr a greener outlook when it comes to energy so there are several projects in development in tnt right now right there, there are projects in development by bp by shell by bhp um the touchstone of course so there are projects here to bring on oil and gas that, that are still happening and going forward, right? And those, those are already sanctioned in most, most cases, and they, they will continue going forward. The question is, what happens after those projects that are already, you know, those yeah, projects that are completed, yeah. what happens with BP and Shell? And they, are they going to continue exploring for oil and gas? Um, will they be bidding on any new blocks? Um, the last bid round would indicate not because they, um, there was no blocks of water in the last, in the last bid round that the, um, that the government had. Um, so I, I, I feel like the outlook on exploration seems to be pretty dim, um, at least in the offshore, the deep water blocks as well. You know, the, the, the southern blocks have been a mixed bag, some, some dry holes, some discoveries, but not necessarily commercial sites. Um, the northern blocks, they do an evaluation now. Doesn't seem to be oil out there, everything seems to be gas prone. Um, putting out a deep water bid round, in my opinion, you're probably not going to get any major players, right? And of course, you can't talk about exploration and deep water without looking at it in the context of what's happening in the region, right? Any big operator that wants to do exploration and deep water is in Guyana and Serena, right? Right. Um, and both countries have deep bid rounds upcoming. Both of them have a lot of acreage license. And of course, between the two of them, they've already discovered like, what, 12, 13 billion barrels uh, recoverable, right? Yeah. So I, I feel like deep water bid around in Trinidad, unless you find somebody who really wants to look for deep water gas, probably is going to be unsuccessful. 
what you probably want to do is look at the mature acreage on shore, have smaller operators um, be, um, directly bid on it or, or negotiate on uh, small fields, ones that they think that they can develop, whether it's heavy oil or deep wells. Touchstone is a good example of exploration and success. Um, they have a lot of barrels in the West Coast um, and what Heritage has. I know they partner in with EOG resources there. Um, so there's they, they some opportunities still, but I don't feel, I feel like it's time for open bid rounds where companies come in and they competitively bid and they really try hard to win a credit. I feel like that time has passed the trend. Okay. So, um, Dirk has a second question. He asked, um, he said that he developed the Cape Oak field initially, enough gas for a full uh, Atlantic LNG train. Uh, what is the plan to fill, fill trains um, and if possible, get train one going? I don't know if you might be the person to ask that question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I can only speculate, right? I mean, I, I, I asked myself, um, where did the government think the gas was going to come from if they wanted to spend the money to turn around and um, trade one, right? And right. to me, the only logical conclusion was that they were banking on Venezuela gas, right? Um, probably from the Dragon Field or the Loran Field, yeah. um, which, which theoretically could come online pretty quickly if they had access to it. Um, of the actual projects and training, um, the projects, the, the gas fields that were, that were discovered, I think they, they could not have been counting on that, in my opinion, right? It, it has to be Venezuela gas or the deep water gas, right? Um, right. Yeah, so, so that would be my way I speculate um, gas could possibly come from for, the, for that train. However, I don't know how long you can maintain keeping one of these, uh, one of these plants active um, without, any, without any supply. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a quick one though. What's the keep back with the cross border fields? Is that just a political thing or? Um, so, so, so let's look at Loran Manatee, right? Loran Manatee is one of a couple of cross border fields, but it's the biggest one and the most well known, right? I think there are actually about three cross border fields. Yeah. Um, but Loran Manatee, I mean, the government. And Venezuela, our government and Venezuela have been negotiating on that for, I don't know, more than 10, probably more than 15 years, I'm not too sure. Um, and it's a big field, right? Overall, that field is like almost 10 TCF of gas. Trinidad right. has a, like, I think less than 3 TCF on our side. Um, and our government indicated that they are going ahead to exploit that, um, that field, that portion on our side. They say that they could get gas on by 2024, 2025. Um, they're not waiting on Venezuela anymore. That's what they've indicated, right? And I believe Shell is the operator on the front that side. Um, was it all back? I guess that, you know, Venezuela themselves have had serious challenges in the last few years. I don't think it's been a priority for them. Um, it makes sense for Trinidad to develop the entire thing based on the proximity to infrastructure, all those BP and Shell platforms and so on. Venezuela, if you look at their, their map, they don't really have anything out there. Right. Um, on the dragon field side, that was not a cross border field, but that is a field that was supposed to be built in a pipeline to Trinidad because to Trinidad platforms because they had like platforms pretty close by. Right. Um, right. Again, technically very feasible. Not sure what happened. Um, not sure what else happened. Right. They, you remember the US also had sanctions on, on, on Venezuela. Um, I'm not sure how that affected Shell and BP and that may have also affected how they um, how they did. How they, how they a bit. progress on this, yeah. Okay. Um, so Kevin Ramrain said, oh, sorry, I lost that question. Um, what, are the quanti what are the consequences for no new acreage being awarded since 2014? Well, Kevin's probably best listen to answer. <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. So Kevin was the one who would have signed quite a lot of these blocks, the majority of them, um, you know, to, in, in his tenure. But the, 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 um, the, you know, the consequences, obviously, is that there's very little exploration happening. Um, there are no minimum obligations really left, except a couple of them on shore. Um, and, you know, you, you want exploration activity to also stimulate activity in the country, right? To have rigs drilling, to have seismic surveys happening and so on. Um, it means that after these batch of projects are finished, right? So the, the Shell North Coast project, Polybri, um, BHPs, um, then you have BP's projects, um, the new Cassia platform, and a couple other things like that. We kind of not really, kind of don't really know what else is coming after that, right? So after about 2025 or so, it's kind of, we kind of don't know what's the next step, what, what, what else is coming on stream. And you see the timeline between the, uh, signing up block and getting gas, right? Um, yes, it's very long. It's long, it's really long, long. right? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, so, I mean, if we start in 2008 and we're coming up at 2024, 20, 2025, that's looking at almost what two decades, a decade and a half. That's a lot of time between if we go to start now, right? Because that puts a gap between 2025 and when next we can have production coming online. So look at the PHP blocks, um, the deep water ones. They signed some in 2011 or 2012. They started drilling in 2016. Um, maybe able to get gas on by 2027 if you're lucky, right? So you look at about 15 years for the deep water gas. If you sign a block next year, you're you talking have- about waiting until... 2037, 20, yeah, somewhere, somewhere there. Right? Yeah. Um, by which time hydrocarbons may not be the thing anymore. <laughs> yeah. and, and the very same companies probably will not be interested. At the rate they go in, it doesn't seem to be um, like that, right? Okay. So Miguel said, great presentation. Um, you mentioned the bond guarantees were not as accessed by the government for various reasons. Is there a time frame within which the government must cash in on this if they choose to do so? Um, the, the, the contracts would probably would probably have in great detail um, um, the terms and conditions upon which you could cash in on those things. Um, but more than likely, it'll be within the term of the contract, right? So, so yes, I, I, I can't, I don't know that more often, um, but definitely the contract would specify what time frame and was the uh, procedure to do so. Okay. Um, I think Miguel asked another question. He said, how many failed bid rounds have there been since 2014? Um, what has been done differently in consecutively failed bid rounds? Oh, these are a few questions in here. Um, okay, so let's just go with the first one, I guess. How many failed bid rounds have there been since 2014? Um, I'm aware that there was a shallow water bid round, you know, last two years that, 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 that didn't um, happen. Um, to me, that might have been the only bid round that they actually did. Eh? There were some announcements about other bid rounds. I don't feel like they others actually came off the ground. They so actually actually, I think it may have only been one failed bid round, but that in itself is an issue because that means we've just not been having bid rounds. Yeah, exactly. Um, so he said, what has been done differently in consecutive failed bid rounds? Well, I guess if we only had one, maybe, um, maybe they so, haven't figured out that yet. Well, you know, I mean, some, some of the same recommendations are there, right? So, so um, I, I see any question here. Are there countries okay. with similar mature acreage um, that we can do a comparison? And, and some of the things that different countries have done, especially mature countries, they've made the data public, right? They've made the data as public as possible. What is it open that is, right? Um, so com- companies can look and see what, 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 what is something of their size. Remember, Trinidad has fields that produce 100 barrels a day. Of heavy oil right and that is actually quite economic for some companies then there are some of them that produce offshore oil or offshore gas or onshore gas you know we have a lot of different um, types of fields and, and you need to get players that, that match them right that's on the technical side of course the next big thing on, is the commercial um what's the taxation regime like right and I, i've talked about it and many people have talked about it at length um, in fact, I know the energy chamber in Trinidad have submitted a long, very detailed proposal to the government about um, re-evaluating the entire fiscal regime and trying to tailor it to different types of um, acreage, you know, so that you, you really look at mature heavy oil fields with particular um, tax terms, um, right. and, you know, you look at it very, very individually and you really market them very specially. We have I don't know if anybody in the chat knows, but we probably have like close to a hundred fields on children that, right? Um, of various sizes, right? Wow. Okay. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of that was operated by Heritage, uh, with Petro Trend and Heritage. A lot of the lease out and farm companies have some of the others. And um, they're small, right? Some of them, these are small fields. Um, some wells produce five barrels a day, some wells produce 200 barrels a day, right? We need to make sure we get the right size players inside here. The days of Exxon and, and Chevron and um, those kind of size companies look into being Trinidad a long road. Yeah, so it's more of tailoring what we have to the companies that are still interested. So that it's both and, beneficial and for them. And, an example, right? Touch two yeah. went into onshore, which is very mature. Um, they have done several exploration wells. They found gas and condensate in areas that, that a lot of people had written off. They are able to bring it to market very quickly because of where it is. Um, they'll, they'll probably be able to supply some of the point as plants. Um, you know, and, and they, but they are size of company, agile, flexible enough 
um, you know, where that, that, that price is, is big enough for them, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think we have the last question here. Um, um, yeah, okay, so yeah. let me see. take it into account one of your conditions. Some companies will spend more. How do you think they should be uh, rewarded in order to be fair and promote this practice? Um, in case they should, you mean in case the companies actually share their own um, existing data? Um, I, you know, I, interestingly enough, I believe BHP said that they were going to make all their data for their deep water blocks. Um, they, they were going to share it or make it public. Uh, even the equation, they still retain. I'm not sure if they actually did it, but that, I think they signal that. Um, you know, I, I, think that, I think that's a good step. Um, it, it, it is a tough one sometimes to, to voluntarily share it. Now, when, the, when I said make data public, I was talking about the open English, right? The one that the government actually controls. Right. Um, legally, you may not be able to make somebody else's English data public, but it, there's a lot of value in sharing, right? If you look at the onshore, there are so many fields so close by and so many different operators. So, you know, some of them literally have wells side by side and they're not allowed to share the data between them. To right? see what both wells look like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes, um, simple things like that prevent um, a lot of two different operators might be drilling into the exact same reservoir next to each other because they don't have access to the same data um, and that again it just it just makes it more difficult to do business it just makes it less um you know less commercially viable and you know things like that so i i, I don't know how you would reward i don't think it needs, needs to be that you reward companies to share their data i think it needs to be that the government encourages them to do that and they also make whatever is available public, right? Okay. Um, Mr. Butron has a question here. He says, does Satsuli have another model for awarding onshore and shallow water acreage? So, yes, actually, to my knowledge. So, the Statsuli, so I, as a good example, so Statsuli is the, um, the regulator in Surinam, right? And they just finished a bid round. So they, they, their bid round was offshore and they did a bid round just like how we would do. They, they, they put out the different blocks that were available. They, um, they asked companies to bid on, on any of them that were, that were identified. And they, so they just completed an offshore bid round that is very much the same as we have done in the past, right? And they awarded a couple of blocks. But they, are also, they also entertain open bidding as far as I am aware where you can directly approach the, um, the, the, well, Satsuli, the operator can directly approach and say, this is what we um, propose. We would like this piece of acreage, we'll drill this amount of wells in this time frame and so on and so on, right? Um, onshore, it's a good question, Mr. Bertrand, because onshore, they recently awarded a block to a Trinidadian company actually, and it was not in a bid round. So I assume the same thing may have happened there where the company was in direct discussion with them um and encourage them to to basically you know well they would have negotiated i suppose and come to some some arrangement and that company in Suriname um is actually going to drill in the next two months an onshore exploration well in Suriname a Trinidadian company is going to drill an onshore exploration well in Suriname in the next couple of months and they only signed that block if i'm not mistaken they only signed that block in 2019 or maybe even 2020 right? oh wow okay yeah, so you're getting a lot faster because the company is actually saying, yeah, what we're going to bid on this block. Um, we actually, I think they actually had seismic data from before, so they knew what, what they were looking what for. What they were looking they for. Good idea. And then they were able to say, okay, we're going to drill in one year from now, right? And that's exactly what they're going to do. And I guess that's one of the benefits of having a more open type bidding process, right? Because, well, that and again, together with uh, open access to data, it gives companies like you said, a longer time span that they can work data and they can yeah. target areas that they feel more comfortable going after um, as opposed to the government just saying this is what we're putting out and this is what you have access to. Correct. So I mean, I, I imagine some of the onshore operators in Trinidad would like more acreage um, close by to where they have fields that may be, for example, on the heritage um, operatorship and the mechanism to negotiate with them is not, is not clear or it's not easy, right? Right. Um, so, 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 yeah, and, and, and I mean, practically, the state hasn't always, has never been the most efficient at operating, yeah. <laughs> uh, at operating anything, to be fair. At right? operating anything, yeah. Yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 
the smaller companies have, have been able to be more agile, access finance and technical information and so on, right? Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunities still, obviously, in front of that. Um, but it, this open building may or may not seem to be very effective anymore. Okay. Well, um, Javed, thank you very much for your time. I think that's about all the time we have there. Um, and I don't think there are any more questions. So um, we'll move towards closing today's presentation. So um, I just wanted to say thank you again for an excellent presentation. Um, I'm certain it was very insightful. I learned a lot personally um, because somehow this is not always the thing that I focus on being in GNG. You kind of stay away from you know the the drilling side you you work until you get to that point and then you kind of hand it off um but thank you very much i, I do i did quite enjoy this and i think our, our participants were also very happy with with the content that you delivered today um before i leave i would just like to invite everyone to stay tuned to um to aapg's social medias and networks um for information on our upcoming sessions um i'd like to say thank you all again and Keep safe and in good health, and I guess we'll see you all on our next Tuesday talk. Thank you very much, Saeed.